um, as we join in with Jesus and the woman at the well on this mission. This is actually a, our mission Sunday in the church, if you realize that or not, and uh, which um, today we do have a mission board meeting, and the, the one that will be the first to forget about attending the mission board meeting be the one who's standing before you, and uh, so uh, just to keep it all in prayer, but uh, the missions of the church, I remind you once again that back on the uh, bulletin board in the hallway, back around by the uh, the um, the waterer there, uh, the fountain, you see a collection of a lot of the ministries that you as a church, uh, we support. And John in chapter 4, just a few words here this morning on hurrying to the harvest, hurrying to the harvest, and and, uh, and, and anybody that has some farming in your blood, uh, this is a uh, this summertime, and as we journey toward fall, there's a lot of harvesting going on, and, and um, we, we watch this as the fields begin to become bare, and um, some go in with a second crop, but, uh, and of course, uh, the harvest, the harvest. I remember a time, uh, it, was, it was in 1990, um, a very, very dry summer. Uh, the corn was really, um, really, was just sadly um, dwarfed, and it was just a hard summer. It was very, very hot that summer. And, um, and so the corn wasn't doing well. And to add injury to insults and hardships, frost came on the 29th of August that year. It frosted. So corn that is already about three-fourths, about a quarter dead, about 60 to 70 percent moisture, and now the frost. So how quickly we hurry to get it in while there was still a little bit of moisture so that it would not mold um, and during its fermenting process. And there were just forage harvesters going everywhere. And uh, when one farmer got done with one with his own or for another the neighbor, they just crossed the fence rows and they kept going to get the corn in quickly and um, the harvest because it takes everybody. It takes everybody. What a beautiful um, passage here. It's a passage that is well known. In fact, this is a text that is often quite comforting to people as you labor for the Lord and um, and and the fact that, that we all, as we labor for the Lord, we ourselves are sinful creatures and uh, seeking to advance the kingdom of God and knowing that, you know, Many times we preach, you teach, you share, we share, I share. You share the gospel many times, and uh, you pray quite often for individuals, and you see no, no, no change, no nothing. And knowing that there's, as the Lord Himself says here, one sows, and Paul will go on to mention that another waters, and then as Jesus says here, another brings the harvest. And our Lord is always sowing. He's always sowing. He's always at work. And uh, so as we read this here passage, just know that while the disciples went away into the town to get something to eat, Jesus was sowing. He was working. He is always working in people's lives and knowing it through your prayers. And he advances and works in people's lives to bring them to the light of the knowledge of salvation. So it is through Christ that we live and we move and we have our existence. And uh, he also makes mention here of that saying. He says that saying that one sows and another reaps. And it's sort of a proverbial thing that the people, when they reason he said that saying is because it was a common saying. And uh, you and I do that. You know we, you know how it is said or that word that is said, that saying is said, and then we come off this ver- proverbial thing. One sows and another reaps and what have you. But in this powerful meeting of Jesus and this woman, and then what he has to say to the disciples following uh, some words that they surely would have remembered later. Let's pick up the account there in verse number 7. A woman came from Samaria. Here in John chapter 4. It came, he, she came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, And who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
living water. Let's pause for a moment. Christ is the living water. Look at how beautiful the village story. Wow. And now God works in his wonderful, mysterious ways in the hardship that that family went through, the shunning, and, and probably even the fear for their lives at times. And now how it all turned around. And the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel right into their homes, not a community well, right into their homes. And so the opportunities then to come and people, as people want to know about the Lord, they do. They don't know how to ask. They don't know what to say. Just as Christians want to share, but we don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. And truly, as your brother had just challenged us this morning, just open your mouth and let the Lord talk through you. Because he's the one that does it all. Just begin as you pray and share the gospel with one another. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. And where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? They're here to Jacob's well. And how famous is Jacob's well. He gave us this well. He drank from it himself. His sons drank from it. And all the livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up. There's always the ministry of this church. Always puts a great emphasis on children. We know that. And the children needing the Lord. The living water. And as you were sharing that about it, I just had, I, my mind went to the children. Oblivious to a lot past and what would happen and taken place in the family. But knowing of the earthquake, knowing that the well had no water, that there was water here. The children your children drinking water. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here. And Jesus said, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right. You do have a husband. For she was a wicked woman. She said, You are right in saying you have no husband. You've had five and the one that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Don't focus here on the woman and her life. But Jesus commends her. He says, you are right. You are speaking truth. And the Lord, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Worship on this mountain. We say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to, woman, ought to worship. And he said again, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. But Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Boom. She was face to face with the Messiah, hearing his words. The disciples come back. They marvel that you're speaking to this woman. So the woman left her water jar, verse 20, uh, verse 28, and, and just went back into town to the people. Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can, there, can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. And, and meanwhile, the disciples says, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know of. So the disciples said one to another, I mean, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What is the will of our heavenly father? 
His will is that there be none that would perish. For God is willing that no one should perish, but that everyone come to the knowledge of salvation. He is not willing that any should perish. Jesus come to do this work. And this fourth chapter is just so marvelous, so marvelous, because as it does, it follows John chapter 3. We're in John chapter 3. There's this great meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus, once again, about the salvation of his soul. And the chapter 3 is full of doctrine. And it's about the doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the depravity of man and Nicodemus. And then he goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit blows where you do not know and where, like the wind, where it comes and where it goes. You've got the doctrine of the Holy Ghost there. And he goes right on down, but he, he, he flows right in there. And as John the Baptist gives testimony to Jesus. Now I want you to note here in this chapter 4 that there was something that he does here that is so noteworthy and that before he goes on to heal, heal two different individuals, he heals this woman's heart and soul. This is the primary, this is the, this is the, the joy, this is the purpose of Christ's heart. He did not come to heal as his first main mission, the sick, the lame, the blind physically. He came to save the lost. He became to save us, the lame, the blind, the, the crippled, the dead in our sins spiritually he doesn't heal everybody he heals according to his will that would be you know in good for the individual and the advancement of his father's will in the kingdom of god this is always at his discernment and we are very grateful for these things but jesus said i have come to seek and to save that which was lost and he remembered as a boy he told his mom uh, as he'd been gone for three days he said i've been gone he, you, where have you been at son I said mom dad don't you know it must be about my father's business once again, what's the Father's business? That none should perish, but that all come to eternal life. So the Lord Jesus here at work, and so I come to accomplish his work. Verse 35, do not say, my dear disciples, there are yet four months until the harvest. We were, the, the, the grain right now is probably coming up about so. Okay, we're, there's, there's no mention of sowing here, but we're right in the midst of the crop. And the, the grain is growing, and, and, and harvest time is usually about March or about April and May there in, in that area. So he says, don't, don't say there's four months to the harvest. The harvest is now. Look at him. He says, look at him. Look, I tell you. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here that saying holds true. One sows another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored. And you've entered into that labor. When harvest time comes with the grain, many, many times and you'll see it, that there is a, a whitish cast, and especially toward the tip of the head of the grain, white unto harvest. What Jesus was referring to is you look out in the field, you're not going to see any white right now. It's all green yet. He says, look, there they come. Lift up your eyes. Lift up from the things of the world, Christian. Look up from the ways of the life that we have. Look up out into the world that needs Christ. He says, look out there. What do you see? It's white, all right. They were coming from the village. All these Samaritans were en route to Jacob's well with this woman. And, and, and she, well, she's probably still back in the town. Go, 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 go. Get out there to the Jacob's well. And, and there they come rushing in their, their white garbs and, and their, 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 their robes and the gowns in which they wore. He says to the disciples, you see them coming? The fields are ready for harvest. Now I'm sending you in there, and you're going to bring them to Christ. And you did not do the sowing, but you're just going to do the reaping. I've already done the sowing. I've been sowing while you went to get food. For the whole past hour, I've been sowing into this one woman. And through this one woman, here comes a whole village and you're going to be privileged to share in bringing them to Christ. He says, go get them. And, and, and the number of people that would have been saved that day and the resulting days, and he stayed with them a number of days after this, and, and the gospel of God, you know, into the hearts of these people and the kingdom advancing in Samaritans who were despised by the Jews. So first of all, the disciples got to get past that. There's no despising and no despicable attitudes in the heart of Jesus toward Jews. He made us all. He made them all. And so he says, now go get them, boys, and uh, bring them into the knowledge of salvation. And, uh, and as Jesus would have been working right with them and teaching them and showing them. And, 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 and then I thought, as I read this once again, the number of dear children. 
the number of dear children, the dear children to receive Christ, and how important that it is, bringing them to the Lord. So many Samaritans, look here in verse number 39, from that town believed in him because the woman's testimony, and he told them all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, then they asked him, stay with him, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And he said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. He should underscore that. We have heard for ourselves. What did your brother share? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have encountered the living Christ. But we say to you, And we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Indeed. There is no other name under heaven by which a man may be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. It is Christ alone. He is the bridge, if you will. He is the bridge that spans the chasm between lost humanity and a holy God. Christ on the cross of Calvary, bringing us into eternal life with him. Christ his great sacrifice for us. My dear friends, I encourage you, do not continue just to wade or to, to relax in the shallows of what you already know about Jesus. That meditate in your mind and muse in your heart, inviting the Holy Spirit to teach you deeper and deeper and deeper the mysterious wonders of the cross. The cross. And what took place there on the cross of Calvary where Christ spanning this great gulf between man and God as he was suspended between heaven and earth for the salvation of souls. And God is not willing that any should perish. So we as the church, and this, surely these disciples would have understood these words much deeper after the cross and, and, and remembering that great commission as Jesus says, Go! Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Their minds had to go back to here. Go back to here. People need the Lord, and people want to know. I was reading the other week, uh, one day last week, I think it was Decision Magazine, and I made mention of this one on, uh, on Wednesday night. Franklin Graham, as he said, probably the greatest trauma the Christians have is losing their courage for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not keeping their courage, but letting fear squelch the faith, silence the faith, silence the passion for God and for the souls of men. Reading, as your brother said, hey, this, this man was loaded this morning, and, and just, just reading, you've got to read, read the word, and, and, and read read about missionaries, read about them and, and the lives that they give uh, for the gospel of Christ, reading, and, and you've got to read, and, and whenever you read the word of God, you'll never be lost for words to say. You just read and, and hide that word in your heart and, and amuse on that word and, and the greatness of the cross and knowing that as you, first of all, as you look out into the fields, look out to it with faith. Go forth into your day with faith that not just to do your work, do this and do that, but you're going to be involved in advancing the kingdom of God with someone that day in your life. Faith says it will be so. And knowing that he is the Lord, the living water, this is the joy of his heart. And as the proverb says, he that winneth souls is wise. So look with faith. Secondly, look out with thankfulness thankfulness just thanking the Lord that you're part of the gospel uh, kingdom that you are you, you are an ambassador for him you're going forth and no matter what happens you're going to share the gospel that's the best news the greatest news the only news that makes a difference in, in, in people's eternal souls you listen to all the news on the internet and, 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 the, and on the TV and what have you and, and with the smart TVs and along with the smartphones you can flick 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 catch all all the latest news and, and that news of earthly things and as sad as and awful as it is and 
with some good little things trickled in, but it will do nothing for man's eternal soul. So it is the news of Jesus Christ. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be to all people, the angel said to the shepherds. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The Lord! He is the Lord, Lord of all. It is the Lord of the harvest that sends us forth. In 1855, Bishop Hannington was on his way to Uganda. Bishop Hannington was murdered by Busaga, the chief, Luba, acting under orders from King Mwaga. So the missionary, Hennington, is killed by Busoga, the chief of the village, under the orders of the king. Killing. That was in 1855. And on April 8, 1906, notice the transition. The son of this same Luba, who is Timothy Mobinho, was baptized by Reverend J.E.M. Hennington, son of the bishop who was murdered. So he who was murdered, his descendant then had the privilege and joy of leading to Christ and baptizing the one through whom he is a descendant of, the murderer. And, and how powerful God turns these stories around. The bishop going in never had a much of a chance and he is murdered. But God works things out in a much greater way and here it is. And so or there's the, uh, the words of James Chalmers who died at last at the hand of cannibals in New Guinea. Recall the 21 years, give me back all of its experience, give me its shipwrecks, give me its standings in the face of death multiple times, give it me surrounded with savages and spears and clubs, give it me back again with spears flying about me and with the club knocking me to the ground, give it back and I'll still be your mission. Still be here. For it is the love of God that compels us. It is the love of Christ. In our love for Christ, when you muse upon the cross of Calvary in your own salvation, and how the Lord works powerfully in your heart to see, open your eyes to see the field is white unto purpose. The more time you spend with Christ and in His Word, the greater the impact. Your love grows, it grows, it grows, it grows. Lord, I don't know how to say thank you. And then in, in Romans 12, he says, just give me your life. Give me your life. I gave you my death. And I'm alive again. Just give me your life. And I'll send you forth into the fields. You know, it's, it's been like these, women like these, who are the songs of heaven. And just praising God for his glory. Great is your reward. And so certainly again, yes, again, from Proverbs 11.30, fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And those who save souls is wise. Wise. Are you paying forward to glory your life? What are you taking? What are you sending forward that's going to be there and, and, and to greet you on the day when the Lord calls you home? Those that you have shared the gospel with. You didn't save anybody. I don't save anybody. Brother Kirk doesn't save anybody. Jesus does the saving. He calls and sends us into the field to do the work. We plant the seed. We nourish and water the precious seed in the hearts of people with the love of Christ, by loving on them, serving them, helping them, guiding them, directing them, praying with them, just nourishing, nourishing the Holy Spirit's work. And then someone comes in, you know, just this, this person's already, it's already, it's already, it's time for harvest. There's someone there. And I've had the experience in all of them. It's like sometimes winning a soul to someone was so easy. Well, it's because somebody else sowed, somebody else watered, and I just got the privilege of it. And at the same time, you do sowing. Never be a part of the harvest in that point. But we do a lot of watering. You did a lot of watering the last couple of weeks. You did a lot of sowing, a lot of reaping, a lot of watering. And so we just thank you so much, dear God, and says, not with faith, not only look with faith and look with thankfulness, look with hope. Pakistan, India, Germany, China, China, Japan, America, everywhere. Everywhere. India has no problem that Christ cannot solve. China has no disease that Christ cannot heal. 
America has no trauma or, or deathliness that God, through his church, cannot restore and bring back to life again. And truly, the church, the reason that the United States of America has become the third largest mission field in the world, and that is because the church has dropped that old saying, drop the ball. The church. Why? Because her love for Christ has grown cold. Why? Because the church has given ways to other things in the culture, the believers. It comes down to each and every one. Not time with God and in his word and making God the priority in life. And therefore, as the church, the fire of the church just weakens and grows less and less to stand and be it fanned into greater, greater fame, a flame and love for the Lord. And therefore, the work of missions right from the heart of the individual to, to the dear children across the table or the neighbor or the families that gather, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the church has lost her vision for our biblical worldview. As Jesus said, go, go, here, go across town, go on into the cities, go across the world, go. Go in my name and people will live, live unto the Lord. Hurry to the harvest. Time is short. Time is short. For soon the day of the Lord will be here. It's always just the next breath away. So it's a call to Christians, number one, take an assessment of your life. Who you're living for. Who, by whose doctrine are you living your life? The cultural doctrines of the world, the peoples, or is it by the doctrines of the Holy Scriptures? Are you building on truth or are you building on lie? Are you building for eternity or continue to build on temporary? Are you living for self or are you living for the Lord? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you laying up as treasures in heaven? Who will be there to greet you because of your faithfulness unto the Lord here? When the Lord calls you in and, 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 and greets you and, and, and celebrates your life and love and, and as, you, as he picks you up off of your knees as you are just in bowing and worship to him the first time you see him and he says just stand up here and, and, you, know, and you kiss the bride, he kisses you and he says welcome home and, and he has called, perhaps has just called from all over heaven the people that are there because of the faithfulness of your life and your ministry and your testimony here in these few short years. As I saw the, uh, the bumper sticker, sticker coming home um, and it just said simply live your dash. Well, okay, I wanted to ask the driver, how are you going to live your dash? How are you living your dash? Am I going back and forth to the beach? And, and what, how are you living your dash? I hope that you're living your dash for the Lord Jesus Christ, living it with eternal truths and principles in your heart and mind. Hurry to the harvest. Hurry to the harvest. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Look under the fields, they are white, until harvest. Hurry, hurry. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious, beautiful word this morning. Thank you for the challenges received from your servant earlier, through the word and the life and the ministry, through the word of testimony, through the word of scripture. Dear God, we praise you, we bless you. Bless you. Hey, Lord, and I pray in here this morning, dear God, any precious soul that's never been born again, today is the day of salvation. Living a life confused, a life that's been lied to, a life that got off on the wrong track, a life that is just full of pain and misery, a life that is full of sadness and will never be right until the individual bows to their knees for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the case with every Christian, every, every sinner who comes to Christ. That's the case with all of us. Not until we bow our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, know his healing love and forgiveness, know the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the Fatherhood of God, and we rise in your life, and we walk forward.
forward with newfound joy that will never be taken away. A new love, which is the love of Jesus. A love that is everything. Thank you, dear Father God. Have your way in every heart and life. Praise you, Jesus. As every one of us Christians in here this morning give you thanks and praise that you were working in our hearts before we ever came to Christ and through whom that person we heard the gospel. And by grace, by grace, it's all grace. We bless you, Lord. Oh, we'll bless you long into eternity for the cross will shine brighter and brighter and brighter as eternity rolls on. No end. Send us forth. May our hearts be willing to go. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we stand and sing this morning, certainly as, as prayed, you know, give your heart to Jesus Christ, come to Christ. Let us stand as we sing and think about your vocations in life and where you are and living strongly for the Lord.